We're going to Paris in a couple of weeks, and we're going to be um, presenting at F FCC. Uh, we're really excited. It's a pretty big deal, uh, and uh, we're going to be presenting about Ethereum alarm clock. Um, Logan is uh, one of our smart contract developers. He actually works closely with Piper um, on the Ethereum alarm clock. If you remember, uh, Piper is from the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, some of the some of the cool things even before this uh, uh, that that he's done, he's created uh, actually a Shapeshift API wrapper. Worked on Token Bank and uh, is just. I mean, I think you'll you'll see uh, regarding the the quality that he brings to the table. So really pumped up, Logan. Thank you so much for being here and uh, for coming coming on here. Uh, just uh, want to make sure that your mic works as well. I think I just saw it, it pop up, so I think it does. And uh, Logan, welcome. I'm really excited uh, to, to see all of this. Um, and I think everyone from the community is as well. Hey guys, I'm really glad to be here. Um... I just want to make sure that uh, everyone can hear me. I think everyone can. I can. So everyone should be able to. And Kenny does as well. Um, okay, great. Okay. Cool. Okay. <laughs> all, all right. right. All right. Well, um, so today we're going to do a uh, the same presentation that we're going to be giving in Paris on the Ethereum alarm clock. So it's going to be a kind of general overview and a development update of what I've been working on for the past couple months. Um, if you've been to one of the webinars before, you would have seen a few demos we put on. This one will be a little bit more technical in nature and we'll really get down into the nitty gritty details of the Ethereum alarm clock protocol. So just a general introduction, uh, the Ethereum alarm clock is an open source smart contract protocol originally written by uh, Piper Merriam, who now works at the Ethereum Foundation uh, in, in uh, 2015. Um, Piper was one of the first original innovators in the space, and he, he had uh, a few projects that were really groundbreaking, including the Ethereum alarm clock. Um, but because he, he uh, divided his time between so many of them, uh, the Ethereum alarm clock kind of fell dormant uh, in uh, 2017 and wasn't really operational for a while. Um, so what I've been working on is getting the smart contracts updated and operational again um, to be deployed to the main net. So the Ethereum alarm clock uh, fulfills this uh, special need in Ethereum that isn't natively supported. So when someone schedules an Ethereum transaction, uh, that transaction is executed instantly. There's no way to say, I want this transaction to be executed in a week or at any point in the future. So the problem that the Ethereum alarm clock solves is to allow someone to say that they want to schedule a transaction at some point in the future. And at the same time, have these crypto economics guarantees that someone will execute this transaction for them. And to kind of better explain how that happens, I want to talk about the two different accounts that uh, Ethereum supports. So there's two types of accounts on Ethereum. We have the users who control a private key and who can execute transactions. And we have smart contracts that don't have a private key and are pieces of code that are deployed to and run on the blockchain. So the problem that Ethereum has is that we want smart contracts to be able to execute a transaction. 
yet the only accounts that can execute transactions are users. So how do we bring these two types of accounts together in a way that will allow us to schedule a transaction and have that smart contract verifiably execute the transaction we want to happen? So enter the Ethereum alarm clock. Um, and now what, what I want to go through is going to, this is going to be the start of kind of the technical side of the presentation before we get to the demo. So I know some of you are probably technical in this room. You'll probably really enjoy this part. Um, if not, if it's a little bit over your head, just sit tight and we'll have a really cool demo at the end. So the architecture uh, involves a few smart contracts. We have about 12 or 14 separate smart contracts that make up the entire protocol. Um, I have them kind of sectioned off in this slide to show the different pieces. So on the left-hand side, we have the schedulers, which are kind of the, the top API that you'll talk to when scheduling a transaction. And those will talk to the request tracker and the request factory to create new transaction requests. And all of these contracts have libraries that they talk to and they all inter operate with each other. So the schedulers are the contract that um, you'll tell, or the contract that you'll feed in the data that you want to be executed. And we'll actually create a new smart contract with all of that data to, to later be executed by agents. So there's two, so two different kinds of schedulers. We have the block scheduler and the timestamp scheduler, just depending on whether you want a scheduler based schedule schedule based on block block numbers or timestamps. Um, the scheduler is using an inheritance pattern with the smart contracts. So we have scheduler interface that uh, so we have the schedulers inherit from a scheduler interface. And like I mentioned before, there's a few libraries that the logic is contained within. Um, so here's a little bit of code sample that just displays the scheduler inter interface. Um, it's a pretty simple interface. It just has one major function that's to scheduler, to schedule, to schedule. Um, and you feed in the address you scheduler, scheduler schedule to the bytes of the call data and eight integers that I'll go into in a second. So at a high level, the way that scheduling works with the Ethereum alarm clock is that users will talk to the protocol and the protocol will emit new smart contracts called transaction requests. So this diagram shows just the flow from how these transaction requests, which will contain the data of a future transaction, is created from a user. And here we have the breakdown of uh, the parameters that are used to schedule, schedule a new transaction. So really quick, I'll just go through each one of them. We have the call gas, which is the gas that's, that'll be sent with the transaction. The call value, which is the value that'll be sent with the transaction. The window size, which is the either block numbers or amount of time that an agent has to schedule schedule a transaction, the window start, which is the beginning of when that transaction can be executed. The gas price, which if anyone's familiar with Ethereum, they'll know the gas price is 
how your transaction gets prioritized in the transaction pool. Um, and then we have a few things which are specific to the protocol, which are the fee, the bounty, and the required deposit. The fee is uh, an optional parameter that gets put back into the protocol. The bounty is what incentivizes agents to execute a transaction. And the required deposit is the amount that's required if an agent chooses to claim a transaction to later execute it. So now I'll talk a bit about the, how these transaction requests are created through the request factory contract. Um, the really cool thing about the request factory, which is a kind of a new uh, smart contract paradigm that's been coming out is that it uses a delegate call pattern with clone factories to reduce the amount of gas that the new transaction requests cost to deploy. So uh, this is a new optimi optimization we just added. So we actually brought the gas cost to deploy new transaction requests down from about two and a half million gas down to right under 1 million gas. So about a 60% optimization due to using a uh, clone factory pattern. And there's a link if uh, any anyone's curious about that. Um, so here, here's just the interface showing uh, the functions on the request factory contract. So pretty simple, just there's one to create a, a request, um, a couple to one to validate the request, one that combines those two, and then a way to check if a transaction request was made through that factory called is known request. And so the transaction requests are the contracts which hold all the data um, that you schedule, schedule in so that agents know how to execute this transaction. So each transaction request is a new smart contract using the clone pattern I mentioned before. And it delegates all the calls to a centralized transaction request core. So the transaction requests actually don't have any, uh, don't have much data attached to them. And it, they have no functions. They just have a single function. And that function is to delegate call, which says, call this other function on transaction request core, which does have all the logic to, to uh, for the transaction request. So these transaction requests hold the funds. Um, so there's no central place where funds are held for the Ethereum alarm clock. Every user has their own contract and their own isolated funds. And an, a really cool um, function of the transaction request is that you can call this proxy function to do cool things like send transaction, send tokens out of it, or uh, send, send arbitrary uh, functions using the transaction request as the message sender. Um, so the main functions of the uh, transaction requests are to execute it, um, which would be called by agents. And then we have a few user functions which allow you to cancel a scheduled transaction. Um, an agent can claim a scheduled transaction. We have the proxy function I mentioned before. Um, and then we just have a few ways to uh, either get data out of this contract or to send payments from it. 
Uh, so the proxy function um, is probably one of the coolest things about the transaction request. Um, and what it allows you to do is to schedule transactions to let's say buy tokens from an ICO. You have this problem where that smart contract, which sends the that ICO purchase transaction, now becomes the owner of those tokens when those tokens are sent. So how do you get the tokens out of the transaction request contract back to where you want it, back to you? Um, and the answer to that is the proxy. Um, so th this of course shows the raw code. Um, to break it down, uh, what you'll do is just, uh, you'll say where you wanna send this transaction to, and then you'll have to send the raw encoded byte data. Uh, for that function. So um, there'll be a better UI for this function. Um, I just wanted to show the raw code there. Um, and then I kind of glossed over this part before, but um, <clears throat> I now I want to talk about the agent in the situation, which is the executing party of this of the ethereum alarm clock protocol um so agents are external um they'll be running they're they're external to the protocol um but they but 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 they're they're an integral part of it and i'll explain how that works um, so agents are third-party software, which we've written a uh, an agent uh, client, and I'll uh, go ahead and give you a little um, demo of that in a bit. Um, and what they do is they they receive data from the Ethereum alarm clock, letting them know about all of the scheduled transaction requests, and then they'll automatically sort these transaction requests into ones that can be claimed or executed on and they'll call either claim or execution um, and execute the transactions to go where they need to be um, and at the same time these agents are making profit from every bounty that is set in a transaction request um, so this just shows the execution data that will be sent when an agent executes a transaction request. So I kind of went over this before. I'll just really quick go over this again. It sends, it, it takes a two address. So it knows the recipient it goes to and it sends the encoded call data of the function, the value, the gas and the gas price. All right. so a little bit more about agents um agents are going to be off-chain clients um but just because they're off-chain doesn't mean they're outside of following the rules of the smart contracts and the protocols it just means that they're going to be running um constantly just checking the smart contract and uh executing uh when when they uh when they're basically uh told to so the agents are incentivized by the bounty that is set in each transaction request um they're completely open to be run by anyone um and chronologic is making it easy, even easier to uh, run an agent um so potentially everyone or anyone can take part in running an agent and possibly earn some profit and the idea is that there's a competitive market between these transaction requests and for the agents so hopefully many people are running agents and there's never a a need for one because as long as people schedule transactions there'll be incentive for people for 
people to run an agent client. Um, and what this does is it ensures that the Ethereum alarm clock protocol is crypto economically sound um, because it provides, it always provides the bounty plus the gas used to execute a transaction to the agent. So there's, there's always a reason for an agent to be online and running. A good parallel to think of an agent against is a miner for a proof of work blockchain, where it's always profitable for a person to run a mining client. We're hoping that people will view running an agent as the same uh, because it's always going to be profitable to run one of those. <sighs> All right, now um, I'm going to go in a little bit into outside of the protocol and talk about EAC.js, which are some JavaScript tools that I've been developing um, to make it a lot easier to work with the Ethereum alarm clock protocol for developers. Uh, so you can think of uh, the tools as kind of subdivided into three different categories. We have a library um, for JavaScript developers to use either client side or server side. Um, we have uh, client functions, which can be used for developers to um, make their own client if they want to, make their own uh, agent client. And then we have a provided command line interface. So it's a command line tool that'll make it that for, for anyone who's familiar or comfortable with the command line, it makes it really easy to run an agent or to schedule, or trans schedule a transaction. Uh, these are all available from NPM. Uh, you can just run NPM install eac.js dash command line dash client or dash lib. So the, the command line, um, I'll go ahead and give you a little demo of the command line. And if, if you've been attending prior webinars, you will have seen this before. But this is just for anyone who might have missed it in the past. So here we are in a terminal. Um, I'm currently SSH'd into a Ubuntu server. And I'm Here we go. I'm running a uh, security node. So to use the EAC.js uh, command line tool, you need to be running a local node with an unlocked account. And if you're curious about that, you can check out the GitHub and we have a, some instructions about getting started. Uh, so the first thing I'll do here is schedule a transaction. and tell it to use block, the block scheduler. So it'll give us a little, it'll start asking us questions. Um, so we tell it the recipient address. Right now I'm just gonna skip through and use the defaults. We can enter the call data, call gas, the call value, the window size, the window start, the gas price, the fee amount, the bounty amount, and the required claim deposit. So all of those things that I went through um, a few slides ago about uh, using the scheduler contracts, this will just walk you through each of those. It'll verify that all the information is correct and it'll send the transaction to the blockchain. And it gives us back a transaction hash and the address of the new contract that we just deployed. So really quick, let's check uh, Etherscan.
And we can see that it did in fact deploy this new contract and funded it with the amount that it needs to uh, send, later send the transaction. All right, so that's the sending transaction part of the client. But what if we want to execute the transaction? Well, we can do that with the command line as well. And we do that by entering in dash C for client. It'll go ahead and open the client REPL. We tell it to start. Uh, we open up the logs so we can see what it's doing. And we can see that we're getting the no new requests updates. But up here, we actually found some transaction requests. So just to make sure we have those stored in here, we can dump cache. And we do indeed are tracking these transaction requests. So these two are based on timestamps. That's why the number is so high. And this one right here is a block time, block number. Um, so we're gonna wait a bit and we'll come back and see uh, when this is actually executed. So, so, that was, so if you actually wanna make your own client, um, we have a library for that. Uh, it's eac.js-client, and it contains all of the logic that goes into, um, th that's behind running a client. So if you're interested in that, definitely go check that um, library out. And if you're interested in working with the Ethereum alarm clock on a lower level, um, so for example, if you're doing a browser integration or um, whatever else, um, you'll want to check out eac.js-lib. Um, and this is a, a wrapper over the main essential Ethereum or alarm clock contracts. And it's designed to kind of feel like an extension of Web3. Um, so what it does is takes a lot of the boilerplate code out of using smart contracts out and makes it super simple just to declaratively say what you want. So here's a little example of how someone might use the eac.js lib. As you can see, we instantiate web three and then just pass it into the lib, get our eac object back. And now we can get the address, get the request factory object. We can get the latest transaction request from a certain block. And then if that transaction request is ready to be executed, we can go ahead and execute that transaction. So if you've ever worked with contracts before, you know this would usually require a lot more boilerplate. The purpose of this library is to take all that boilerplate out. Um, so before I get into the web app that we've been building, let's just go check to see if that transaction has, be, has been executed. And it hasn't yet. It looks like we're still about 10, 15 blocks away. So let's let that sit for a second. Um, but what I'll do now is show you guys the web app that we've been building. So, be, so as you can see from the rest of this presentation, the Ethereum alarm clock is pretty technical to work with on a lower level. And what we've been trying to do is make this a lot nicer to use. 
So here's the example of the web app. Um, what I'm gonna do now is schedule a transaction with it. So you've seen how I do it on the command line and now you're gonna see how much nicer it is to use a web app. So I've already put some variables in. So like before, I'm just gonna go with defaults, but we have an information page. We can set the bounty here. If we're gonna require a deposit from agents, we have that option too. And then we double check everything we entered in was correct. We hit schedule, schedule. We've got MetaMask installed, so a MetaMask window pops up. We say yes, submit that. The transaction is being mined. Let's go check Etherscan for that. And uh, while we're waiting for that, we get this nice little uh, image showing us that the transaction is being mined. And there we go. Um, so just like before using the command line, we were able to schedule a transaction and we can see that it made this new contract here, which holds a value and is the transaction request contract. All right. so. We've also been working on a transaction viewer page. And uh, the latest will be a time note. So like this, like I have an agent running here, uh, we know that's, it's, it's harder for people to set up a command line tool. So, in the interest of making it a lot easier for people to set up agents, we're building a time node agent client uh, that's located in your browser. So what we'll have, what, what, how it's gonna work is you can use a key file that you make on my crypto and upload it here and start executing transactions and making profit um as easy as that um i don't have a key file right now so i'm just going to leave this here um for the next update on this make sure to tune in next week um and we'll have a, a better walkthrough there and just just really quick i want to jump back here and I saw that we had executed the transaction, so I'll dump the cash. We'll see that 99 means that's been executed. And we'll go and get stats. And we'll see that this client has already made 0.15 Ether. So it's profitable to run clients. Um, yeah. And just to wrap up here, I want to talk about a few of the use cases that someone might want to use the Ethereum alarm clock for. So as mentioned before, um, it could be used to schedule a transaction uh, to buy tokens from an ICO. So um, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with staying up late at night to uh, make sure you click a button to buy tokens right when the ICO begins um, because it might uh, sell out right away. So in to 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 um, instead of having to do that, wouldn't it be a lot nicer just to weeks or days before just to schedule a transaction saying like this is this is what I want to do and when. Um, and so I'm sure that's going to be one of the big use cases here. Um, but besides ICOs, we have any transaction that 
needs to be completed routinely, such as rent payments or a phone bill. Those are just two examples. Um, can be scheduled monthly here with the alarm clock. Um, one of the coolest things is it also opens up a lot of cases for automation between smart contracts. Um, this is something we're working on with the debt smart contract at Chronologic. And, um, but also has a lot of other uh, potential applications. So, uh, one example of that is uh, the Ethereum alarm clock canary, which is a way to just make sure that the alarm clock is operational. And what it does is it schedules a transaction to itself every two or three hours. And as long as it's feeding back on this scheduled transaction, uh, we know that someone's running an agent and the alarm clock is operating correctly. Um, besides that, we have the EAC.js library. Um, so we're hoping people might use the alarm clock in uh, client-side dApps, like the one that Chronologic is building. And of course, uh, running an agent um, or a time node is going to be a huge use case. And that, that about wraps up um, the presentation here. So Eric, yes, go so, ahead. So Lo Logan, I, I just want to jump in and I want to say th thank you so much. I, I, I really uh, appreciate it. And I think the, the entire community does uh, as well. Um, that was fantastic, and I, I can't um, wait to, to to see kind of how how um, uh, to see all the updates as well next week. Um, the the one thing that that I wanted to say, and I wanted to to talk about some more, uh, is those different use cases, and you know the. The, the reason that we see this, at least personally, um, as s such an important um, important project and an important contribution is because when you, when you look at um, uh, Ethereum by, by itself, um, sure, it wasn't necessarily meant as some type of currency or anything, anything like, like that. Um, but a lot of people now are, to an extent, using it um, in, in that way to make different payments and and, uh, and and things of that nature, but you don't have these features and this core functionality that's, that even allows you to use it that way, which obviously um, kind of hinders certain things because if you're trying to plan um, and any, any type of, uh, let's say, business that you want to run, um, anything that you want to automate, uh, th this is a very core and important function. So th that's that's what we um, see as uh, as the biggest contribution why we're so excited. So let's go ahead. Let me let, let me see what I'm going to do is first of all, I want to say thank you to everyone on here. And let's go ahead and let's open it up um, for some questions. Um, I do see that people were some, some people were asking, hey, you know, what's going on with the what's going on and what's happening how is uh the the token gonna actually be used here or or is it gonna actually even be used in here so i i know the team responded to that but um the, the plan is that basically uh, staking in order to, to become a, a time node um, is going to be in day um, and, and that's going to be the primary feature. So, so if someone wants access to a time node, then they, they must be a holder of day. Um, the exact amounts and things like that will we can we can discuss sometime in the fu future. Um, does everyone hear me? Just want to make sure, Logan, are you still hearing me? Because Brendan said yes. that there's no audio right there. Okay. Um, so, so Kenny, that's how it fits in to the to the picture regarding token integration. Um, is that uh, if if you do want to be a time node, then you do need to be a holder 
of of day and uh this isn't uh this isn't a promise or anything but uh what one of the things that um we were uh that that is on on the table is um kind of certain supporters so if you're a much bigger supporter and let's say you've um you you have more day then um you're gonna potentially and and again um this might not happen but we're you know Playing around with uh, certain ideas that uh, you you might have priority access to mine or execute um, certain transactions um, over over others, and then um, as well collect uh, obviously those those bounties and things like that. Okay, so um, and 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 Scottish boy said, "Will there be a wallet?" Um, uh, so you'll be holding your your day tokens at your uh, at your regular address okay um let me see so hopefully that answers the the question uh and uh, th right that therefore um that that would that would be kind of how the integration would work all right so uh guys thank you so much I really appreciate it. We're going to wrap it up. Um, let us know. Please go ahead. Feel free to put things into, into Slack. Um, we are working, and, and the, the whole team is working on this um, quite intensely, uh, and we are pretty excited. Uh, this is going to so, – so if anyone's in Paris as well, uh, you can meet us there. The, the, the pretty much the whole team uh there's going to be i think uh, around uh i think nine nine potentially 11 people from from the team there so it's it's going to be quite a bit okay um all right guys thank you so much uh logan thank you so much as well do you have anything else to to add otherwise let's go ahead and wrap it up uh no that's all i have I we're, all we're right, all fantastic, good. and uh, I I'm very 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 pumped up and and excited about the next steps. All right, guys, take care. Bye bye.